my name is Ann Lorenz. I'm one of the nurse practitioners at the Arthritis Center of Nebraska. And our topic tonight for Knowledge Night is gout. And we provide these talks to the public and to our patients basically to uh, delve into a particular diagnosis or condition that we treat um, because of the time during appointments is just pretty limited. Um, so we'll just unpack the diagnosis of gout and I have kind of a presentation, but if uh, as I go along, if something isn't quite clear or whatever, it's okay to interrupt me and, um, and ask. At the end, we'll open it up for our other questions. Um, I would just say if there's something pretty specific to your personal health history, um, you might want to just ask personally. I'll be around for a while after we're, we're done. Um, but general questions, sure, um, ask the whole group. So gout is the big ouch. Um, so tonight we'll cover what is the diagnosis of gout. Um, there are a number of medical conditions also that are associated with gout or often seen in our patients with gout and we'll go through those. Um, we will, uh, I'll describe how gout is diagnosed and how we treat it. And then um, as a patient, if you have gout, what can you do to help us and help yourself in managing the gout? Where am I not pointing to? Is that the next one? Okay. So I'm not going to get delve in too much into the history of gout, but it has been recognized for a very long time. The first uh, description in the literature or in, um, in history was in 2600 BC Egypt um, as a description of arthritis, the big toe, and that's still how most people think of gout is the big toe. It's known as the king of diseases and the disease of kings because it's associated with uh, more wealthy type uh, food and drink practices, over overindulgence and that sort of thing and rich man's disease is another term. We'll talk about why that is. This is a picture I found on the internet um, of you know, a guy experiencing an episode of gout. Um, they're obviously wealthy, drinking wine, enjoying his cello, and uh, this devil comes up and puts a hot poker on his big toe, and um, that's often how gout will, will uh, show up just very suddenly while you're in the middle of doing whatever you like to do, it'll just uh, arise. Um, the microscope helped us uh, figure out what was going on in the condition of gout. And uh, in the 1600s, initially is when um, gout crystals were seen and described in synovial fluid. And synovial fluid is the fluid that's around a joint. In the 1800s, they figured out the relationship between the gout crystals and the elevated blood levels of uric acid. And then in the 1900s, of course, they started doing more, more uh, and more uh, investigation in this at that point, and they found that if you took the tophaceous material or gouty material and injected it into a normal joint, you could induce a gout flare. Um, which sounds really mean. Um, and then uh, in the 1960s is when the polarized mic microscopy was developed, and I'll describe in a little bit what that means, but it makes it much more clear what kind of crystal you're looking at under the microscope. Um, so the polarization really is uh, what helps us in diagnosis. So uric acid is a normal product that's in the body. It is a waste product. And um, the problem is if the level gets too high in the body, then the uric acid crystals uh, can form. They're monosodium urate crystals. And those crystals can settle and deposit in joints, in tissues, under the skin, or even in the organs. And eventually, these crystals can induce attacks of inflammation and they can cause problems in the joints or the tissues that they're sitting in. 
and the body, the body has certain levels at which things are kind of even and, and happy. That's called homeostasis. But if in the body the, the uric acid level gets over 6.8, that's kind of the solubility threshold at which above that the gout crystals can form. There are certain things that also influence the formation of gout crystals, including the temperature. Um, they tend to form in cooler parts of the body, like the lower extremities. The pH levels in the blood, so the acid-base uh, balance of the body can impact the crystal formation. Hydration level, and not only of the joint, but of the person. Um, so we'll talk about the importance of hydration. but. Um, a lot of gout flares will occur during the night. And part of the reason is that the, the joints become a little dehydrated during the nighttime hours. And that seems to be one of the components that can lead to a flare. And um, sometimes gout will flare in joints that are, are already damaged. Um, some sort of prior trauma or osteoarthritis or some other form of arthritis in the joint. So hyperuricemia is essential for the development of gout, but gout, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there, but the majority of hyperuricemic patients never develop gout. Only 5% of hyperuricemic patients actually develop gout. So we don't want to just be treating hyperuricemia um, unless the patient has, meets the diagnostic criteria of gout. Um, different, no, we don't really understand why some people with hyperuricemia develop gout and some do not. Um, we'll talk about some of the risk factors in a minute. Um, but a lot of different um, thoughts have been, been thrown out there, but individual differences in how the body reacts to the crystals, um, genetics, of course, um, all are factors that seem to influence that. So why do, why do the uric acid levels get too high in the body? Well, the uric acid, excess uric acid is excreted by the kidneys. So if the kidneys aren't doing a good enough job in clearing that extra uric acid, um, you're, you're going to get the blood level. The, the blood level is going to become too high. So that's impaired excretion of uric acid leads to hyperuricemia. Again, hyperuricemia is that blood level that's too high. Um, another cause might be that the individual just makes too much uric acid, so you overproduce it. Overconsumption of purine-rich foods, so some of those rich foods that, that I mentioned earlier, and we'll go through that in a minute, um, that can lead to hyperuricemia. There are other diseases, medications, and toxins that can contribute to hyperuricemia, or it may be a combination of one or more of these factors that can cause the hyperuricemia. So what, how, how many people does this affect? How big of a problem is this? Well, the CDC numbers, the Centers for Disease Control numbers from 2000, 2000, 2007 to 2008 showed about 3.9% of the U.S. individuals, or 8.3 million people, suffered gout. About three times more men than women will be diagnosed with and suffer from gout. Also, the incidence is higher in black men than black, or than white men, excuse me. And um, some other uh, ethnicities seem to have higher prevalence. The prevalence of gout has increased over the last 20 years, probably because we, we have so many, so such easy access, really, in the U.S. to lots of rich foods and drink. Uh, however, the diagnostic and therapeutic uh, opportunities for treatment have really, really helped so that people can um, avoid going to the, the last stage of gout, that chronic um, destructive stage of gout. We really can do a lot about gout. Uh, what about mortality and the overall cost of gout? Well, men who have gout do have a higher risk of all-cause mortality from cardiovascular disease than men without gout. And that kind of goes back to some of the other medical conditions that we often see in our patients with gout. Gout is not usually the, the cause of death, but it is um, present in uh, or, or is associated with these cardiovascular disease mortality 
um, causes. So it's a secondary thing. Um, in 2007, gout and other crystalline form of arthritis uh, were 1.5 percent of the um, 1.17 million non-federal hospitalization costs, and about $2,800 per person in the annual cost of gout. So what are the other uh, medical conditions that are often coexisting in gout patients? Uh, obesity, diabetes, and me metabolic syndrome, hyperlipidemia, which is high cholesterol, hypertension, which is high blood pressure, atherosclerosis is uh, hardening of the arteries or uh, arterial disease, kidney disease or insufficiency, um, and myeloprolifer myeloproliferative diseases are certain cancer treatments, generally cancers of the blood or bone marrow, and where there's a lot of cell turnover. So all of the, uh, many, many of our gout patients have one or more of these comorbidities, and it does impact what our treatment choices are, and um, treating these diseases will often make the gout better as well. So non-modifiable risk factors for gout, things that you cannot change, are gender. Males are more affected. Advancing age, as we get older, both men and women are more likely to develop gout. In women, um, postmenopausally, the incidence of gout goes way up. It's pretty rare in premenopausal women. Ethnicities, like I said, black men are more likely than black uh, or than white men. Uh, Pacific Islanders and um, also have a higher pre prevalence. Organ transplant recipients, uh, I think it's because of some of the medications that they're on and that their acid-base balance is a little bit different. And also genetics. Most of our gout patients have an uncle or a dad or a brother that also has uh, gout. So the modifiable risk factors for gout um, go back to those other comorbidities, the obesity, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, um, alcohol intake, particularly beer and distilled spirits. Um, so that's always a recommendation, cut back on your beer um, when we're treating gout. Diets rich in meat and seafood, and that gets back to the high purine foods. Some medications, including uh, certain diuretics, can increase the uric acid level and predispose you to gout and some other medications. So when patients come in and we suspect gout, we look through their medications and see um, if they, there are any contributing medications or those associated risk factors. Gout has natural stages, four natural stages. The first is asymptomatic hyperuricemia, which is just asymptomatic. There are no symptoms. Patient doesn't probably even know that they have high uh, uric acid levels in the blood. It's not causing any symptoms. Then, at some point, uh, an attack will occur or a flare of acute arthritis. Often it's in the big toe, but it can occur really in any joint, um, typically though in the lower extremities early on. And the gout attack, whether it's treated or not, it, it will eventually go away within about seven days, um, but those are very you know, unpleasant days. Then between attacks is an intercritical period where things are quiet. And honestly, when many gout patients will think, hey, I don't have gout. I, everything is, is good. I have no arthritis. But then it comes back, and you get that acute flare again, and you kind of cycle back and forth between acute gouty arthritis and the intercritical period. And eventually, um, the acute attacks become worse and worse. They become more frequent. They might involve more joints. Uh, they might involve more inflammatory or um, uh, more severe symptoms like fevers and uh, you're just sicker with them. And those intercritical periods can become shorter and shorter. Um, and that gradual transition goes into chronic tophaceous recurrent gout. And at that point, um, it's really heated up and the patient may not even have an intercritical period anymore. They may just have chronic inflammatory arthritis and uh, result in, and that can result in damage to the joint, obviously joint pain, in, uh, limited mobility, et cetera. Tophaceous deposits can develop and that is basically collections of 
gout crystals that form and collect under the skin. And they're lumps that, that you can feel, you can see, um, often on uh, the outside of the elbows, the patella region or the kneecap, sometimes on the ear, uh, the pin of the ears. But they can also collect internally, like in the kidney, um, and result in kidney stones. So what happens in acute gout? I'm probably preaching to choir here, but severe, like excruciating, you can't ignore it, um, pain. Uh, I feel like an ice pick is going through my big toe. That kind of very uh, uh, colorful descriptions usually of what that experience is like. The joint surrounding tissues are red, they're warm, they're swollen. Often uh, the patient can't put their shoes on, they can't stand having a sheet over the foot. It's um, exquisitely tender. Um, it usually is the lower extremities early on, um, but really it can occur anywhere in the body. Um, some people have their first flare in the ankles or the midfoot or the knee. Um, then later on, as, as things are progressing more to a chronic condition, we'll see it in the upper extremities. Uh, fever, sometimes with the, uh, as it becomes more and more uh, severe flares, we'll see fevers and chills. Again, may occur in damaged joints, uh, that acute onset, sometimes waking patient from a restful sleep, and uh, usually one joint at a time early on, but then they become polyarticular, or more, more joints involved per attack. Yeah? Is it always accompanied by fever? Or? No. The uh, question, is it always accompanied by fever? No. In fact, that's kind of more of a later on thing where the, the attacks are more and more severe, more systemic inflammation. So, yeah. So this is a picture of pedagra, which is the um, medical term for gout attack in the big toe. Um, you see that first, first toe at the base of the toe is red. It's warm. It's swollen. Or, well, I, I presume it's warm. Um, in this patient, also, the ankle is swollen. Um, with an acute flare of arthritis. If we were to numb this up and put a needle in the toe, um, and if we could pull some fluid out and analyze that fluid, we could see uric acid crystals, and that's, that's really our gold standard for gout diagnosis. We'll talk about that in a minute. This is another flare. It's more in the midfoot, ankle region, but swollen, um, red, warm. Often after an attack like this, the, the skin will kind of peel away a little bit. After the swelling is gone, the, the skin will kind of de desquamate and, and pull away. That's, that's very common. Intercritical gout, again, asymptomatic, variable de duration. Uh, most un untreated patients will, with gout will have another flare within two years. And the chronic recurrent tophaceous gout, they become increasingly worse, polyarticular, um, and can le lead to bony erosions, actual damage to the joint, and disappearance of the intercritical periods. At this point, with a chronic um, recurrent gout, it can easily be confused or misdiagnosed as a different kind of arthritis, such as RA. And then the tophaceous deposits or kidney stones. These are pictures of tophaceous deposits on the pin of the ear on the left, and then over the PIP joints on the right. And you can have gout flares in the tophi, too. And it kind of looks like these are maybe flaring. And those, too, if we were to aspirate some, t or some substance from one of these tophaceous deposits, we would see a full field of uric acid crystals. This is an example of um, osteoarthritis with gout. The um, fourth finger, uh, the DIP or end joint on the, the left hand, that joint has osteoarthritis, but also clearly it has tophaceous deposits and is red and inflamed, and then the third on the right. This is an x-ray of a, a hand, obviously, with some damage from gout. If you see that second finger where there's um, you know, at the end of the metatarsal, there's a big bite out of the cortex of the bone, and the rest of the, of the finger is kind of subluxed off. It's not sitting on the metatarsal head right. And um, these are the kinds of erosions that we see in chronic tophaceous gout. 
and the, these joints hurt. This is what we want to prevent. And then the kidney stones, they can clog up the, the urinary system and obviously cause a lot of pain. So a definitive diagnosis should be sought once we um, are, are suspicious of gout. The diagnosis, again, is most secure with the mi microscopic um, validation of, of uric acid crystals, particularly that polarized light mis microscopy, either from the fluid from a gouty joint or the tophaceous uh, material. We sometimes have to make a presumptive diagnosis of gout if we can't get any crystals. Um, and the criteria for a presumptive diagnosis of gout, we really stick to these quite quite um, strictly. Um, well, uh, we don't want to just say, oh, your big toe hurts, so you must have gout. Um, no, we, we want to have the whole clinical picture um, fit with that because once we diagnose with gout, we are committing the patient to lifetime treatment. So we really want to make sure that it's an accurate diagnosis and we're not treating something that isn't really there. So classic history of one or more episodes of monoarticular, one joint, arthritis, followed by intercritical periods that are symptom-free, acute uh, flares, so the maximum inflammation within 24 hours of the attack onset. Podagra is very suggestive, um, and podagra, not just my big toe hurts, but my big toe got exquisitely painful, it got red, warm, et cetera, and gradually the symptoms subsided after about a week. Tophaceous deposits, that's very suggestive gout. If, if you have those, though, we'll probably try to aspirate them. Hyperuricemia, just one of these um, criteria, not, not the only thing. And then if we see evidence of gout damage on x-rays or MRI. And occasionally, uh, a surgeon will send to us a patient that they happen to see tophaceous deposits in an arthroscopic um, procedure on, on a patient and uh, they'll send them to us for gout treatment. So polarized microscopy is making, basically making adaptations to a regular microscope in order to better um, clarify gout crystals, uh, the appearance of gout crystals. It involves adding the polarizer on the bottom and then a compensator on the top, that little red, red slide. A red compensator is what they use um, in visualizing crystals. And one is put at a 90 degree angle to the other. And then when, when you put the, oopsie, when you put the slide in, um, in uh, you know, where the slide goes, you can tell what kind of crystal it is based on the color of the crystal. And it'll be on a red background because of the red compensator. So the color of the crystal and the direction that the crystal is in relation to the polarizer. So this is what our lab techs do, and they're very, very good at analyzing them and finding the crystals for us. Basically, this is their kind of cheat sheet, but um, based on the, the um, orientation of the crystal to the polarizer, either parallel or perpendicular, they can tell, and the color, they can tell if it's a uric acid crystal or a different kind of crystal. And this is a picture of the microscopic view. The top one is a regular non-polarized microscope. And you can see some you know, needle-like things there. Um, but it's kind of nonspecific. But then when you add the polarization, you get the background color, so they kind of stand out better. And then um, the yellow crystals, which are parallel to the um, uh, polarizer. And gout crystals look blue when they're perpendicular to the polarizer. Uh, they're needle-like, they're linear, um, and uh, those are gout crystals. Other crystals just look different. Oh, here's a picture of the, the scope, um, like an arthroscopic procedure um, with tophaceous deposits along the cartilage there. With a, an acute gout flare, our primary goal is to terminate the pain and uh, the disability as promptly and safely as we can. With any kind of inflammation, the best way to, to abort the attack is to start early. 
before that inflammatory process is really heated up. So within a few hours of the symptom on onset, optimally. With gout, you want to continue the anti-inflammatory treatment for the acute attack for two or three days after it's, uh, all of the symptoms have resolved. If you take nothing else from tonight's talk, I want you to take the last thing on here. The urate lowering therapies like allopurinol and euloric have no benefit in aborting a gout attack. If you're already on one of those, when you have an attack, you continue it. You don't change anything. But if you haven't been on your allopurinol and you have a gout attack, don't start your allopurinol then because it can make your attack worse. You want to wait for a couple weeks after the gout attack is over before you initiate that again. The patient can use ice, rest, um, call us, and um, you know take analgesics, get the symptoms um, taken care of. But, but optimally, anti-inflammatory medicines are what will um, really get the symptoms to go away. Our three options are the NSAID analgesics, which I'll talk about that on the next slide corticosteroids like prednisone and colchicine. So NSAIDs are, are the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. They decrease inflammation, they decrease pain, and they can decrease your temperature too if you happen to have that. They are used at the maximum anti-inflammatory doses if you can tolerate them uh, for an acute gout flare. Endomethacin is one that is often associated with gout, but there are a lot of other anti-inflammatories. Uh, again, most effective if it started early and continued for a few days after this, the attack is over. We can't use these or have to adapt our usage of them in patients that have certain comorbidities, including poor kidney function, ulcer disease or gastritis, Poorly, uh, poorly controlled cardiovascular disease or blood pressure, heart failure, et cetera. It's just not, not the safest option in those patients. Also, um, we avoid them if patients are in anticoagulants like Coumadin. Aspirin should not be used for a gout attack. If you're already on a baby aspirin, just continue it. That's okay. But for the, um, as an anti-inflammatory for a gout attack, that isn't your best option because certain doses, uh, doses of uh, aspirin can actually make the uric acid level go up. Colchicine is another option. It is a nice anti-inflammatory for crystalline arthritis. It's one that we can use in patients that are blood thinners. It again, or also is best if we start it early on. We divide three tablets basically over a 24 hour period, either one initially and then another an hour later, and then um, another, another like later on in the day, or three tablets divided up at like eight hour intervals throughout the day. Once things kind of settle down a little bit, go to twice a day, and then um, as, the, as the flare subsides, go to once a day and continue for a little bit for a few days after the attack is over. We use this a lot for prevention of attacks while we're getting the allopurinol or uh, urate lowering medicines started. Um, we do use just one tablet a day usually with that. It's usually very well tolerated but can cause some GI symptoms like di um, cramping, diarrhea, particularly with higher doses. So that's why we don't push the dose too much. We do have to also reduce the dose a little bit of this or limit it with poor kidney function. Corticosteroids are a third option for anti-inflammatories during an attack or as we're uh, getting gout treatment started. Um, these are safe for patients with poor kidney function. So sometimes this is all we have, really, that we can use for a gout attack. Prednisone is the one that we usually use orally. But um, corticosteroids are available in lots of different forms. They can be given IV, so like in patients who've had surgery and uh, then have a gout flare after surgery. Um, IV solumedrol will abort the attack. Um, they can be given intramuscularly for patients who can't tolerate oral prednisone. Um, and uh, 
oh, and intraarticular. <laughs> I couldn't remember what the last one was. Intraarticular. So we can put the, the steroid right into the joint. So if it's just one joint that, it, that is flaring, you can come in, we aspirate it, we put some steroid in it, and that is often very effective for aborting an attack. We do um, caution or use caution in patients that have diabetes, heart failure, and a poorly controlled hypertension. But usually, um, with our doses, people do just fine. With patients that are um, more in the chronic phase of gout, they can experience rebound attacks. So once they finish their prednisone burst, they right away start to flare again. So in those patients, we do a more prolonged treatment with prednisone. Um, and usually that just kind of circumvents that problem. Oh, and sometimes we'll use a combination of those, the NSAID, colchicine, and, and steroids. We can use one or more. Then in the intercritical period, we want to address the underlying reasons for hyperuricemia, lifestyle things, dietary things, um, weight loss, and reducing the body mass index actually will help your gout. And uh, so that's always part of our conversation in our overweight gout patients. We don't necessarily manage all your comorbid, comorbid uh, conditions like hypertension and hyperlipidemia, but we will ask you, are you seeing your primary doctor? How are your lipids? We'll look at your blood pressure. Um, you know, are you up to date with your kidney doctor, your heart doctor, whatever? Sometimes we'll get a 24-hour urine collection, so a big jug that you collect your urine in for a day and then bring it to us for analyzing. Um, and we can characterize whether you're an overproducer of uric acid or an under-excreter. Some populations we do that with. It's hard to get it accurate, though. It's hard to get an accurate sample. And then during the intercritical period when things are quiet, and you have some coverage with the anti-inflammatories, we start the anti-hyperuricemic medicines to lower your uric acid levels. We'll also talk about diet, and um, if you've read anything about gout, you know about the purine-controlled diet. High purine foods are um, foods that should be really avoided in all gout patients, if possible, the organ meats, game meats, meat extracts like um, broths and bouillon, that kind of thing, certain seafood and, and beer. Moderately high purine foods are a lot of good foods in there. Vegetables, um, the lentils and dried beans and stuff, those are good foods and we don't, we don't really recommend that you cut those out because it's really hard to lower your uric acid level just in making dietary changes alone anyway. We can do that very effectively with the medications and it just isn't very um, realistic or palatable to continue a very strict low purine diet in the long term. So while we talk about this, we touch on it, um, this isn't our main dietary education focus with gout patients. Rather, it is the um, healthy eating in order to lower the body mass index. The risk of gout significantly higher in proportion to the elevation in your, in your body mass index. Very direct relationship there. So as you lose weight, your gout can get better. A strict low purine diet um, can lower the uric acid level by one milligram per deciliter. Well, if you're Uric acid level is 11 or 12, and we need to get it to 5 or 6. That's not going to get us very far. We're going to have to use medicine anyway. A diet with limited calories, complex carbohydrates rather than simple carbohydrates, decreased saturated fat, etc., that can limp or lower the uric acid level by more than a strictly low purine diet, so 1.7 milligrams per deciliter. You'll hear about cherries or cherry tart extract. Um, there is some, there are some small studies that seem to show that it can decrease the inflammation and gout. If my patients come in and they're on this, I think that's perfectly fine. I'm not sure how the other doctors uh, and NPs uh, and, and Kristen feel about that. Um, I think as long as you get it from a reputable source, it's okay to use it. 
So antihyperuricemic medications, uh, if you have gout and hyperuricemia, um, we will need to uh, probably start you on antihyperuricemic medications to keep the uric acid level under control so that you don't develop chronic gout. So the patients that, and these are the gout patients that we see typically, are the ones that are, have been at it for a while and have more um, of the chronic disease. So the tophaceous deposits, a lot of attacks and more um, escalating uh, frequency or severity of attacks, the um, x-ray damage and gout, or the gout-related kidney problems like kidney stones or kidney insufficiency. Those are our indications for uh, uric, low, uric acid lowering medicines. As we're starting those medicines though, it's absolutely essential that we have some anti-inflammatories on board because the urate lowering medicines can actually precipitate a gout attack. So um, before we start those, we always have a, a week or so of the anti-inflammatories in place and we start them low and gradually increase. We encourage plenty of hydration. Again, don't start the allopurinol or uloric during an attack. If you've been off of it, just stay off of it until things are quiet. The, uric, the allopurinol and uloric um, urate lowering medicines are forever because it's a chronic condition and the uric acid level will go back up once you're off of it if you truly do have gout. For gout patients, compliance does seem to be a problem. This is actually a study that showed that. To your study, less than 20% of patients were adherent to treatment. And, uh, and we do deal with this in the clinic. Um, and sorry to say, but gout patients have kind of a reputation. Um, but you know, th this is just one study that showed that. And I think probably compliance levels in, in a lot of things are, are not nearly what we'd hope that they would be. But I think educating the patient why the medicines are important and, and everything, I think that's really important. And that's, what, that's one of the reasons I chose this topic, actually. Um, Let's see, that, yeah, and again, the vast, the vast majority of patients with gout will, will have recurrent symptoms. They tend to think, oh, hey, I've been out, I'll appear and all things are quiet, I must not have gout anymore, and sometimes we'll stop their medications. Well, it, it will come back. Allopurinol is the product that we use the most. It inhibits xanthane oxidase and reduces uric acid production. We start the dose low, so 50 to 100 milligrams, and gradually, like over weeks, increase the dose until we get the uric acid level, level controlled. For patients without TOFI, we shoot for six or less. For those with TOFI, five or less. And again, sometimes patients are starting at 10, 11, 12 uric acid levels. Allopurinol, usually very well tolerated, um, but we monitor for skin rashes, alterations in the blood counts or the liver, um, liver numbers, and again, it can precipitate an, an attack, so we have to have those anti-inflammatories underway before we do anything with allopurinol. Very rare risk of a severe skin reaction. Um, I've seen this only once, um, but I always warn my patients, if you get a bad rash, I want to know right away and stop the allopurinol. We do have to re dose reduce the, the allopurinol if there's reduced kidney function. Euloric is the newer or a newer product that we can use. It actually works better than allopurinol, but it's 10 times more expensive. So um, unless the patient can't take allopurinol, like they have um, a very poor uh, kidney function, we usually start with allopurinol rather than euloric. The doses are 40 or 80 milligrams in the U.S. It's approved for 120 milligrams in um, Europe. Usually 40 or 80 does the trick very nicely. Uh, usually well tolerated, but, but we monitor kind of the same things as we do with allopurinol. And it can be used more safely in patients with moderate kidney disease. Probenicid works in a different way. It actually um, it causes the kidneys to excrete more uric acid. It only works, though, in people with adequate kidney function. So there's a, a large cadre of our, our gout patients that this just wouldn't work for because their, their, your, or their kidney function is suboptimal. So it benefits those who don't excrete enough 
enough uh, uric acid, the underexcretors, which is the majority of gout patients, but again, only if their kidneys are okay. We titrate that one up to, and we avoid this in patients that have had the urate kidney stones. And it's just not used as much. Europe, I guess, has a, a uricocerc agent that's stronger than probenicid, and they use a lot, but we don't have that. This is our last option for gout treatment. It has, um, it is an IV medicine, Cristexa. It works faster than the allopurinolic or your loric, so it's a good option for patients that have a large, uh, large tophaceous or uric acid load. It will get that down more quickly. It is a bit of a um, commitment, though. You have to get an IV with pre-medications every two weeks, and it's continued until it no longer works. And eventually, the patient will develop antibodies against the medicine, and then it doesn't work, and then the patient's more likely to have an infusion reaction. Um, you, you have to also be on the anti-inflammatories when you're on Cristexa because it can precipitate an attack. There are a few agents that they're looking at in, in clinical research for treatment of gout. Um, so the Anakinra is already out on the market for RA and juvenile RA um, for various different reasons, um, some for gout attacks, some um, to treat uh, the uric acid levels. But the, these are the, the basically the, the pearls. The, if you take nothing else from tonight, please take these little tidbits. Uh, the gout diagnosis is best secured with that polarized microscopy um, analysis that shows urate crystals. The anti-inflammatories treat the acute attack, and they help prevent attacks as we're lowering the uric acid. The uric acid lowering medications um, doses should not be altered during attack. If you're already on it, continue. If you're not, don't start until things are quiet. And the uric acid lowering medicines do need to be continued indefinitely. I always tell my gout patients, if you have questions about what the, what the directions were, please call. Um, because sometimes it's a little bit confusing at, at the beginning. If you're on three different anti-inflammatories and we're adjusting this and that, it's always okay to call. Or if you have an attack and you're not sure what to do, we try to tell you up front. But if you don't remember, please call. The best diet for gout is the low calorie, basically healthy eating, weight loss diet that probably your primary doctor and your heart doctor and your kidney doctor are already telling you to, to follow. And then just to avoid those high purine foods like the beer and a game and um, certain seafoods, et cetera. And drink lots of water. And lastly, gout is very treatable. We do it all the time. It's not rocket science, but uh, sometimes it's challenging for the patient, I think, to stay on board and, and uh, stick with the treatment. But it is very treatable, and uh, we definitely want to keep it from going to that chronic phase. So hopefully you're not feeling like that right now. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs>